Welcome. We're kicking off the uh, Pivoting to Online Teaching uh, open course on edX. And one of the first individuals that we're interviewing is Justin Reich, uh, professor with MIT. I've known Justin's work for, for many years. He was one of the, the early uh, individuals who took more of a research-oriented or a scientific lens on how things were transpiring in massive open online courses and what the impact of that was. And I know he's got deep expertise in this area of the experience of teaching online as well as researching that environment. So to begin, Justin, maybe you can just share a little bit of your role at MIT and a little bit of background. Uh, yeah, I'm an uh, assistant professor at MIT. Um, I've spent a bunch of years uh, studying massive open online courses, and I've taught a few of them. And uh, now I uh, run a lab called the Teaching Systems Lab. All right. And uh, can you provide a little bit of background in terms of the kind of research that you're engaged in? Like, what is it that keeps you entertained these days in, in your uh, research profile? Sure. So a question that I've been interested in asking um, for maybe 10 or 12 years now is how do people from different backgrounds and different life circumstances use technology differently? Um, and so uh, people commonly associate that question with the idea of the digital divide. And people usually think of the digital divide in terms of access, like who can get devices in broadband and who can't. Um, a lot of my work studies the digital divide of usage which is that even if you could snap your finger and give everybody the best computer in the world and everybody great broadband access, um, there's still good research that suggests that people from different life circumstances have different opportunities to use technology differently. Um, for instance, one of the things that we know about uh, people who move between online and on-campus courses is that there's kind of an online penalty. Um, people in online courses typically are more likely to get lower grades and more likely to drop out than people who are in on-campus courses. But that penalty doesn't affect everyone equally. Um, the penalty is worse for our most struggling, most vulnerable learner. So students who have low prior achievement, students who are ethno-racial minorities in the United States, uh, younger students, students from poverty impacted backgrounds, all of those folks are more likely to struggle more um, in online courses uh, than other, you know, more affluent, more advantaged folks. Um, online courses work pretty well for already educated, high achieving students, um, and they really typically don't work very well for everybody else. They offer some kind of flexibility under certain life circumstances, um, but this notion of an online penalty for our most vulnerable learners is something that I hope that everyone in higher education has in mind as they think about pivoting to online learning. And that's a, I mean, that's a terrific point to emphasize because there's been other results, uh, research I should say, that's communicated. I know Barbara Means addressed this in, in a book she did a number of years ago that addressed specifically sort of teaching online about the challenge that um, if you're doing okay in universities, you'll do okay or you're in the profile of okay online. How, or, uh, but if you're disadvantaged in the regular university system, the online environment will actually likely exacerbate the negative impacts of that. Is there something that a teacher that's, let's say you're in a university in, I don't know, uh, somewhere in Midwest US or you're out in Europe or you're out in Australia, is there something that faculty members can do to minimize the negative impact for that particular student population? Um, I, I think if we knew easily how to do it, um, we, we would have figured this out and there wouldn't be an online penalty. Um, so one realistic answer to that is no. Um, I mean, the other thing is under the circumstances of a pandemic, the, the students who we're talking about that are already struggling, um, they're the people who are most likely to be called in um, to care for siblings and care for older family members. They're the people who are most likely to be affected by a recession and by job losses, the people who are most likely to be affected by, um, you know, insufficient healthcare systems. Um, so like under the best of circumstances, like under normal human life, there's an online penalty that we, you know, can expect. And all of that is going to be worse under a pandemic circumstance. Um, I think there are probably three things that people who are teaching online courses could think about in these contexts. Um, number one, an, Wherever you're from, a number of your students are not going to have regular access to devices in broadband. Um, and so you need to think about how you can have as much of the learning experience as possible be able to be facilitated in some kind of asynchronous way. 
Um, you know, there are students from Harvard who, whose families are homeless. There are students from MIT whose families were evicted this year. You know, and, and all of those things are going to be much more of a significant challenge in the vast majority of higher education circumstances. Um, so assuming that your students can spend, you know, three or four hours a day sitting in front of a Zoom conference synchronously is just not realistic for your most vulnerable students. Um, second, I think what I have been able to glean, there's not great research on what the best virtual online instructors do, but what I've been able to glean um, is that they distribute a mostly asynchronous curriculum and then they spend the vast majority of their day checking in with students. Um, proactively, the people who are having the hardest time may also be the ones who are least able and least willing or least likely to reach out for you to help. Um, if I was teaching an online course under these circumstances, I'd print out my roster, I'd put it on a grid, and every time I have a communication with a student, I put a little tick mark next to it. Every text message I send, every time I pick up the phone to call them, every time I respond to a Piazza discussion board, and I'd see who I'm missing. And I'd make sure the students who had the lowest grades before the semester closed were getting two to three times the number of check-ins from me um, as typical students were. Um, and then I think the third thing we need to do is just be really realistic and realize that for lots of students, they simply aren't going to do very much learning between now and May. Um, in some courses, let's be realistic, that's not going to be a big deal. Um, so if you're teaching an elective, if you're teaching layout, we should find some mechanism to pass these students on the basis of prior work and call it a day. Um, in courses that we're teaching that are like part of like essential courses to majors or part of long prerequisite chains or things like that students may really need the material that they're supposed to be learning over the next couple months to be successful in the rest of their higher education career that's probably the most important thing that school administrators that department heads that faculty can be doing right now is saying how are we going to identify the material that's most important and the kids who are most likely to miss it and start making plans now for August, for September, for January of next year, whatever that is, to be able to help kids, students, you know, people who are taking classes be able to catch up that missed material. That was a great suggestion. I think in particular the, the fact that quality instruction is at a distance uh, or online environment. Um, there, there are low tech or minimal tech options that primarily center around just being aware and caring for, for students. And I think the suggestion of identifying how much do you interact with, with different students, because there's a natural thing, and I've, I've spent many years at Athabasca University teaching 100% online, and quite often the students that you're most aware of are the ones that are most engaged. They're the ones sharing their ideas. And, um, and, and as a result, you're biased toward those students just because they're more noticeable. But to intentionally identify students that may not be getting the attention they deserve, especially if it's related to their grades, is a, is a terrific strategy. Um, and the other thing, I think anyone that's going to do a fully online Zoom session for two to three hours, even with the best of students, is going to be disappointed because it's, we just aren't able to sit and watch a TV screen on, uh, you know, for three hours on topics that we may not be directly interested in uh, you know in a significant way so if you were and you've already provided some of this answer but I'll, I'll just sort of there's a final question ask you like what you're now a faculty member at a university your courses are being forced to go online you don't even want to do it it's uh, you distrust the medium perhaps you're not confident the medium all kinds of things at play what kind of advice would you give new faculty members to start in this environment um, so the first piece of advice is to try to partner with your students. Ask them what they want the rest of the semester to look like. That will do two things. One, they'll tell you how they like to learn online and give you ideas and may volunteer to help. They may give you better ideas than you know, your institution's um, instructional technology staff are able to give because they're working with hundreds of people and your students are just working with a few faculty. And second, um, we commit to things that we feel like we're a part of. So if we invite students to participate in this process, um, that will be the best chance for this to be able to work out. Um, I think in most cases, the thing to do will be to either give students independent projects or find some already existing course material that you can help people work through. Um, if I were teaching my learning media and technology elective right now, I would just say to students, we're canceling the rest of the material for the class. Go do a research project on how some part of the school system that you're interested in is dealing with this crisis and 
write a paper, make a presentation about it, and let's meet every other week to talk about it um, and just sort of record your experiences and, and take what we've learned the rest of the semester and see if it helps you make sense of this. That's probably manageable and interesting for my students and probably manageable and interesting for me. Um, if I was teaching, you know, um, uh, you know, a calculus course that just is like right in the middle of what students really need to be successful or a computer. I mean, it's mostly going to be, I think, in the sciences, um, in mathematics and STEM courses where there are these things that people just can't miss. But it could be for English language learning classes or other things like that. I would find the very best online materials that already exist that people have already spent a bunch of time with. I know that a bunch of online providers are making all their materials for free. The OpenStax textbooks are always free year round. But just pick a chunk of that, try to come up with, you know, look at what I thought would be a realistic goal for a student to get through in a week. And then I would cut that in half um, because I think people are underestimating how much worse things are gonna get for young people over the next couple of weeks as more and more folks get sick. Um, like we shouldn't, we shouldn't base our estimates of what can be accomplished on where we are right now. We should base it on you know, an unfolding pandemic. Um, and, uh, and then I would just think to my, you know, I'd say, students, go do your best through this. I'm gonna help us set weekly goals. If you achieve those weekly goals, I'll come up with extension projects or other kinds of things for you to do to explore. Um, but then mostly I'm gonna spend my week trying to really rapidly give feedback to people on the little assignments that are part of that weekly chunk of material so they feel like they're getting some ideas from me. Um, and then I would um, spend the rest of my time calling and reaching out to folks and seeing who needs help and who needs somebody to talk to and how I can be there for them. Um, I think those are the two basic, you know, and then the last thing I would be doing is I would be thinking to myself, how can I advocate for the students who are most likely to miss out on learning during this experience and make sure that my university is figuring out some way to help them get caught up in August, in September, October, as the world returns to something that looks more like normal. Yeah, that I mean, terrific points. And I, one of the things I really value in your, your insights here is the just the, the care component of this, if that's quite the right word. You know, being aware that students experience this differently, being aware that there's a range of different outputs that are going to be happening uh, for, for everyone that's involved, and particularly pronounced for individuals who are already disadvantaged by the system. And then additionally, there's the reality that, that faculty, teachers, instructors also have their own care needs because you're trying to transition online while you may have parents who aren't uh, being impacted. You may have concerns beyond the course that need to be considered. So I think some significant uh, aspects that need to be reflected as well. Um, so for instance, this is my daughter Adela who's like floating around in the background while we're talking. Um, and it's probably good for everyone involved in the system to remember that you know just about every student, just about every instructor is going to have young, some young person, some older person floating around in the background who needs help, who needs yep. some kind of attention. You know, she needs to finish her book and go get a glass of water. Um, but uh, you know, we all are going to have about ten minutes of uh, talking with people on a Zoom call or some kind of thing. Singers thing before the people around us need a hug and needs some attention from us, um, and that's about as far as we're going to be able to get. All right, you can go now. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> well, that's a fantastic point to end on because you're right. This this isn't happening while every other part of our life pauses. Like the, for many teachers, this is an add-on to an already full personal, social, professional life, uh, in addition to all the additional stresses that arise from, from now, uh, concerns of, of health and community concerns. So I really appreciate you taking the time to join us today, uh, Justin. Thanks for fantastic input. So thank you. All right. Good luck, everybody. All right.